Rajasthan. A motorbike journey that will change your life forever. Dedicated to Kieran J. Lear for his inspiration, Chris Lear for saying all my ideas are great, and Rebecca Waring for always saying do what makes you feel good. Written by Kevin J. Lear, narrated by Kevin J. Lear. The Prologue India, the land of mystery, intrigue, leopards, tigers, snakes, mosquitoes, camels, spiders, and dust. But the worst of all, you will discover later. I was to arrive in New Delhi for the very first time and was thinking to myself, I will land get myself through customs, be picked up, and should be dead by around lunchtime. At least that was the version English TV had given me. The stories we will read as we progress together are interesting, challenging, unbelievable, breathtaking at times, and absolutely hilarious, looking back. India. 1.2 billion people, seven policemen, quite a few frightened goats, lots of teeth, roads that will scare the living daylights out of you, especially when they just disappear, along with vehicles coming towards you on the same side of the road trying to kill you, fabulous people, jaw-dropping historical places. Food to make your tongue go numb and your eyes water. All in a land smothered in a billion colours. Welcome to the land of dreams that will change your life forever. Chapter 1. Thoughts of Death Allow me to start at the beginning, then there'll be some stuff in the middle, and ultimately we will reach the end together. Back in October 2015, I had just turned 57, I received a message through a social media system called LinkedIn. This was from some chap offering me an opportunity to ride a motorcycle in India. The opportunity was to be after this chap's motorcycle tours would be set up later in the year, and would I be interested? Why me? I thought to myself, of all people in the world. Why me? How very interesting. Having had a number of these messages offering such opportunities, which I had declined, I might add, from several sources, offering to take me on a ride into the Himalayas, I still do not understand why I said I would be interested. India. Who wants to go to India? I'd seen bits on TV about India, and why would anyone want to go there? After all, it looked madder than a madman, with every reason to be mad, with a side order of mad. Plus, the vision I had was that they all lived in shacks or tents, pooed into holes in the ground, having placed their feet in two footholds. Then a vision I had was along the lines of, how did they wipe the bums whilst holding onto scaffolding, holding themselves up from falling down the poo hole? It was even worse for me, as I wear an ileostomy bag on my belly for my poo, so how the hell was I going to squat, hold myself up, open the ileostomy bag Velcro fastening, push out the poo, wipe the opening, close the Velcro? Maybe I could place some string around a local tree and hold that with my teeth to stop me from falling into the bottomless poo pit whilst praying I would grow two more hands before I arrived. The approach about this opportunity was taken with a pinch of salt and over time I forgot all about it. Probably because it seemed that any and every Indian person who had a motorbike thought they could set up tours and wanted the white man to help bring them customers. 
A few months later, a message came in from the same chap, offering me an opportunity to ride a motorcycle around a region called Rajasthan in India. I'll be riding a Ducati Scrambler for around two weeks and be part of the first adventure of theirs around this Rajasthan to showcase to the world what could be done. Ooh, Ducatis. Well, at least it wasn't going to be riding rusty old Royal Enfields. So my mind started to wander, thinking, Rajas who? Where in all creation of mankind on planet Earth was this Rajas whatchamacallit place? Quick, find my computer and open up Google Maps. Type in Rajasthan and press find. The results came up. Oh my God. That's where it is. Bloody ding dong. That's a long way away. Rajasthan. Brain went into instant overdrive with this following instant thought. That is where all those terrorist people live, killing people in orange overalls on social media, isn't it? Yikes! You can bugger off, I thought. I'm rather fond of my throat, just the way it is. Once I'd calmed down and removed myself from under my desk, I wondered, was the temptation to get a white man over to India? Take him right into the centre of this Rajas whatchamacallit place and be paraded on social media, having a very close shave. I'd be nuts to even contemplate such a thing. I mean, really nuts. However, for some reason, and I still don't understand why, I replied with a, yes, tell me more please. I guess it was because that time of year suited me perfectly, having finished my motorbike adventures of Cumbria and the Lake District, and I had some time spare. I mean, Lake District? India? Not much difference, eh what? Going back to look at Google Maps, this opportunity was a hell of a long way to go, and up to this point, the closest I had ever been to India, was stuffing my face with Chicken Madras, followed by arguing with the Indian waiter over the bill, and even that didn't go down very well. Over the next few weeks, while organising my flight details, I asked numerous questions. This was mainly due to my anxiety level going through the roof, and when you read some of the questions, you might get a sense of my mindset. When will it be? How many are going to be on the ride? Who will be looking after me? How many others outside of India have you invited? The answer to this last one very nearly had me asking for my flight to be cancelled or finding a way to back out at the very least. Maybe I could break a leg. Surely it can't hurt that much. Or I could come down with an awful case of I'm scared to go to India flu. Well, you see, the answer to the last question was only you. Only me? I thought. Only bloody me? I will be the only white man in India. Run away now and do not stop. Do not look back as the nasty demons will get you. My thought process was along the lines of, well, that's it then. Land early morning. I should be taken hostage by lunchtime and be on social media with a knife at my throat by mid-afternoon having my very close shave. So, take off from London with an eight-hour flight. Through customs at the other end in around an hour, Picked up and taken to my destination. I should be dead within around 12 hours from departure. Excellent! Even though my mind was going nuts with imagination, there was this unimaginable force drawing me closer to this adventure. Organising the flight, this wasn't exactly straightforward, because not only had I trawled through Skyscanner to find the cheapest way there, and bought a flight for around £450 return from London, not a bad price I might add, especially when a one-way train ticket from London to Edinburgh would be 150 making this flight price very reasonable indeed. Then, you need a visa. And I was not told this till two weeks before departure. Yippee! Had I managed by default to weasel my way out of not being taken hostage and killed, as I didn't have enough time to get a visa? Um, no. I managed to get a 30-day visa online quicker than very quickly, so no more excuses. No more excuses? Oh, really? I'm sure I could think of a few more. 
What I will say at this point is, there are times something comes into your life that for reasons unfathomable, it is like a magnet pulling you towards it. And the harder you try to pull away, the harder the magnet pulls you towards it. Let the journey begin. Chapter 2 Take Off to Doom So, I travelled down to New Haven in Sussex to spend the night with my best pal so that he could take me to the airport and look after my car. The journey from home took longer than the bloody flight and I was only travelling from Appleby to New Haven. The roads in this country of ours, England, are a total disgrace. No longer fit for purpose and I can't believe the volume of vehicles on our roads these days. It's quite shocking. Anyway, off I went towards my doom. Well, when I say I went, I was pulling out even the night before my flight because I didn't think I would look very good as a hostage. Plus, someone cutting my throat would really make my eyes water. I arrived at my buddies ready for a sleepless night prior to departure and shared some of my feelings with them and his good lady wife to have the reply, Leah, you big puff, you're going, said my best pal. He was not listening to my reasons for not going, pushing me into my car at 2am as he was taking me to Heathrow Airport. But, 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 but! Stop trying to sound like a moped, my pal went on. I was trying very hard to reason with him, but my excuses, although to me sounded reasonable, they all fell on stony ground deaf ears. Listen, he said on the way to Heathrow. Where are the keys to your motorbike? Why do you want to know that? I replied. So I can go and get it and sell it when you don't come back. You see, isn't that what best pals are for, eh? To make you feel good and warm all over. Even he thought I'd be dead within the next 24 hours. Arrival at Heathrow was uneventful. Unlike my return, more on that later. And into the departure area, I trolled with my rucksack over my shoulder. I was wearing my held rider equipment suit, carrying my crash hat in its bag. This had a few people looking, wondering what I was doing wearing this motorbike suit and carrying a rucksack and lid. Doesn't look like Hugh McGregor or Charlie Borman, does he? I could hear those thoughts going through people's minds as they stared at me without fear of moving their eyes when I caught them looking. The price of fame, eh? Let's have a coffee, I thought to myself, as it's ages until boarding, especially when the shiny marble floor was just about empty of any other human presence, even though there were a few bodies scattered around trying to sleep on seats, and even some trying to sleep standing up. Coffee! God blimey, I didn't realise I'd be buying the whole bloody airport. Bing bong! The flight for Air Canada to New Delhi is now open. Please go to your boarding to get your boarding passes and to put your luggage through. Oh well, no going back now. I do however recall thinking I need a wee and my mouth is very dry. I mean, what happens if the plane is shot out of the sky above Iraq or Afghanistan? Or I turn my head round to see the tail falling off? What if... Come on, Leah, think of better excuses. Eventually, though, the boarding procedure and into the seat of my aircraft from Air India. I plunked my bum into my seat, having first removed my former adventure boots and placed them behind my seat. There was a wall behind my seat, this would be my home for the next eight hours-ish. I just knew I should have removed my knee protector pads from my trousers as well because the legroom in the seat sideways and forwards was just about enough to fit a midget. I had managed to get a seat where nobody would be behind me so no knee cricket with my back would not be experienced on this flight. Thank heavens for small gifts. One of the challenges I was concerned about whilst in the aircraft was I wear an ileostomy bag on my belly due to having an operation in 2000 that saved my life. The operation had resulted in my large colon being removed and my arse being sewn up. So I wear these bags to catch my poo which of course needs emptying. When said poo gets too much. 
The toilet facilities are so small no cat could be swung and having to just about undress to flop my bag into said toilet pan, undo the Velcro fastener and push said poo out was somewhat concerning to say the least. More on that experience later. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now ready for takeoff. Please make sure your seat belts are fastened, your seat is upright, place your head between your knees and kiss your ass goodbye. Well, maybe not the last bit, but my mind sure heard it. Thundering down the runway, there was no way I could kiss my ass goodbye, that's for sure. And if then by magic, up, up and away into this wonderful flying machine we went. Feeling weightless for a fleeting second and up into the clouds. New Delhi, India. Here I come, ready or not. Best get your cameras ready. My destination was some 4,000 miles away, where I was to meet someone I had never spoken to. Hang on, what the hell am I doing? I must be nuts. Oh, shut up, Lee, you're on your way. The flight was uneventful except for my introduction to Air India food, which was, to say the least, spicy. And that spice sent signals to my tummy resulting in... It was emptying of the bag time. Something I'd been putting off for as long as I could. Plus I was in desperate need of a wee-wee too. The toilet was just to my left. So I didn't have far to walk and thought, right, here goes. Opening the door to be shown the inside of the toilet cubicle, thinking there is not a cat in hell's chance I'm going to manage this situation. Sardines in a tin came to mind. I managed to get my braces off, undo my trouser claps and zips, then shoved said trousers down with my underpants, turned round and sat on the pan. Time for a breather and to mop the sweat from my brow. Now, I thought to myself, how in God's creation of mankind am I going to get my poo bag opening inside the pan? I've forced my ass so far back, I'm surprised the aerodynamics of the plane side were not affected, and only in being able to really move my right hand, I carefully shoved my hand into the pan, grabbed the Velcro fastening and opened the flaps. I was hoping the poo was not going to explode out like a shotgun and land in the gusset of my trousers like a direct hit on a baked bean factory. Then, the blasted plane started to experience turbulence. So here I was, bouncing around as if I was on a space hopper, with the opening of my poo bag just into the pan while I pushed down from the top of the bag to empty and then, having to wipe the edge of the opening and close the flaps with the Velcro with one hand. Why the hell had I worn my motorbike trousers? Why? Then it was wee-wee time, by which stage my willy had chosen to retract into my throat from fear of being smothered in spicy Indian poo, it was hard enough to wee when you're standing still with nobody watching, never mind playing trampolines in the sky. This was whilst half standing because I'd just saved myself from being sucked inside out after pushing the button, by mistake, to flush. This was due to because I'd forced my arse as far back as possible and then tried to push back even more so I could get my willy out of its hiding hole to wee. Bloody ding-dong, I thought. I'm not doing that again. Would you like more food, sir? I was asked, and I shall let your imagination come up with what I said in reply. There was no way on earth I was eating any more to start the process of that pooing adventure again, that's for sure. Just short of nine hours after takeoff from London, the bump of the plane as it touched down in New Delhi was so soft it was as if we had landed on cotton wool. I found myself thinking, what an absolutely wonderful flight is without question the longest flight I'd ever done, and the cabin crew of Air India were beyond any doubt simply superb, as they couldn't have made me feel more at home if they tried. Plus, what a bonus! The plane had not been shot down as we flew over Afghanistan and Pakistan. What a result! Although during my toilet experience, I wouldn't have cared at that moment if it had been. The plane came to a halt, and standing up to put my boots back on, retrieving my jacket and lid from the overhead locker, everyone walked towards arrivals. It is at this point I would like to mention the calm way this happened, with no pushing, shoving, 
or battles to get off the plane. It was all very calm, as if there was not a care in the world. After walking what felt like the full length of India, the passport and visa control section appeared and started to queue. Oh, and did I say queue? Each desk was manned by one person, but there were six people manning the individual stations, so all in all, it wasn't that long until I was at the passport control desk. What are you here for, sir? I am on a motorbike adventure around somewhere called Rajasthan, I replied, smiling and looking smug. Where will you be staying? I have absolutely no idea, was my reply. The look said it all. A bloody stupid white man coming into my country with no idea where he's going. Eventually, after taking my fingerprint and mugshot picture, I was allowed through to retrieve my rucksack from the conveyor belt and I headed towards the exit. I'd never experienced anything like this before, and it was a pure joy to behold. Everything was being done without any panic of the world is coming to an end, I must be first, get out of my way. I exited the airport and, oh my God. Did I say, oh my God. Chapter 3 I Entered Paradise On exiting the airport, the noise was unbelievable with the beeping of car horns and people shouting, offering, Taxi, sir! Taxi, sir! I hit the Delhi air quality at midnight and instantly couldn't breathe. The air quality was so bad, it was like trying to breathe through a mattress with the air being forced in coming from a million hair dryers. On full blast. I found myself having to think about breathing along with finding the chap who was going to take me to my hotel. Breathe, man! Bloody breathe! Gasp! Medic! Oh, OK, not quite medic. But here I was wearing a British motorbike suit, carrying a 50 kilogram rucksack over one shoulder and a crash helmet in the other whilst trying to find my driver, who I was told would be waiting, in amongst what seemed like a gazillion other smiling drivers shouting, Taxi, sir! Taxi, sir! Sod off, I thought. I walked up and down this line of cards with names on, looking for my name, for what felt like three days. I eventually found mine, nodded at the chap, and off we went. Who said it was a race? This chap wasn't any bigger than five foot, and around six stone wet through, who took my lid? That was the lightest item to carry, thank you very much. And off he shot towards his car like a scalded rat, with me in pursuit gasping for air. In heat and humidity, never experienced before. Wondering how long it would be before death. My taxi driver didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Indian. So the 30 minute journey to my hotel was, shall we say, very quiet. Except for my introduction to Indian traffic at midnight. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. Yes, the traffic in Britain was at times interesting with traffic jams and road rage. But this took traffic to another level as it was absolutely Bonkers. Every car I could see, and no doubt ones I could not see, pressed their horn constantly. Beep, beep, beep. Get out of my way, they beeped. What the hell had I arrived at? And was this how I was going to die? I just started to laugh. What else was there to do? First a little chuckle, probably out of being nervous more than anything else, which grew to more of a laugh, which is an international sign for this is mad. Or at least it was the way I laughed. My taxi driver looked at me as I looked at him across the cultural divide and he must have understood because he started to laugh too. Or was he thinking, stupid white man? I would like to say at this point here before going any further, when I say white man, I'm not being in the slightest racist. I think the Indian people are fabulous 
and would happily live in India, but you will discover later on with the group I was with, they called me the white man, and I called them the brownies. With everything being taken in fun. Moving on. 30 minutes later, having beeped our way through traffic, overtaking other vehicles on the right, left, and I'm surprised we didn't drive over the top of some. I also discovered lights on vehicles at night seemed optional. In other words, vehicles appeared out of the darkness with frightening regularity. And as for cows, well, that's another story altogether. We arrived, eventually having survived the traffic apocalypse. This was child's play to what I would face within 36 hours and after 11 days. We arrived at the Hotel Plazio in Gagon, which was still within the confines of New Delhi district. Now, at this point, let me state, as previously mentioned, I was expecting to be taken to a tent or a hut with no running water and a toilet consisting of two feet-shaped markings on the floor with scaffolding to hold on to to prevent falling into the poo pit. On exiting my taxi, I got instant gravel rash on my chin from my mouth falling that far open with surprise. Arrival towards the door, the door staff, dressed in glorious splendid clothes of many colours, looking very military, bowed their heads with their hands clasped together in front of their face, saying, Namaste. Namas what, I thought? This is a respectful greeting or hello, I was to learn. It made me feel very special, I must say. I thought they only did that in films, and yet here they were greeting me in this way. I do confess I thought they were taking the, uh, er, <clears throat> you-know-what. The entrance door was open for me, and I was starting to feel like royalty. I had just entered paradise. Absolute paradise. Had I been transported by time machine to another country? Where were the old tents and footprints in the sand? Directly in front of me, the floor was an ocean of gorgeous brown marble, with striking pillars of brown marble reaching for the moon, and a reception desk of pure marble dotted with what looked like stars from the night sky. The reception staff, immaculately dressed, greeted me with bright white marble-type smiles against their gorgeous brown skin with my booking forms ready for my signature. I thought to myself, I could put up with this for a very long time, as I was blown away by everything I was now surrounded by. Sheer luxury. I filled in my arrival forms and handed my passport for photocopying. My luggage had gone through security scan and had been brought in to be sitting next to the lift, on my right, ready for my departure to the floors above. My dream was interrupted by... Room 28, sir, and please, there is a lift. Enjoy your stay. Off I went with my rucksack carrier. This way, sir. To the second floor, and directed into my room, which would put anything in Britain to shame. It was out of this world, and not a tent or feet-shaped markings in sight. I was shamed, though, because I had no Indian currency to tip my porter, and I did my best to say sorry. My room was incredible, offering a huge bed, large glass-walled bathroom. If anyone was with me, they would be able to see my bits in the shower or sitting on the toilet, which was a bit strange. Deep-piled carpet and bottled water. Excellent, as I'd been told to drink nothing that wasn't in a sealed bottle. Do not drink the water, and while on the subject, to eat nothing they call chicken. It was after midnight, so undress, shower and beddy buys off to the land of dreams. Although I was beginning to think I'd already arrived there. The following morning my worries were starting to subside, ish. My ability to breathe had not improved, so much so in fact I felt like vomiting. My head was spinning and I was still having to concentrate on my lungs working. 
I was considering I may have to return home it was that bad, even with the air conditioning on. Luckily, this went away after a couple of hours. My mind then wandered to mosquitoes. Had one hunted my room and helped itself to a pint or two of my blood. I was not sure, but I did know I wasn't itching, so maybe not. Besides, I was and had been taking my anti mozzy death tablets before I arrived and would continue to do so. So no real worries, ish. Maybe. Kind of. There was only one thing for it, and that was to bat on and see what happens. Get showered? Whilst getting showered, I stayed tight-lipped so no water would pass my lips. Well, I'd been told not to drink the water. Sorted and down for breakfast. Having not taken any footwear except for my motorbike boots, I went downstairs in sock-covered feet. Well, it was warm at 8am, some 16 degrees outside at 8am. Oh, bring it on! Whilst my bedroom was air-conditioned and was still warmer than the whole of England at this time of year. Hey, this is okay, isn't it? I thought to myself. Warm? Fabulous hotel in December? Happy days. And nobody even looked at my feet when I walked through the lobby to the breakfast area. So there I am in India for the very first time. On my own. In a hotel breakfast area. Faced with a magnificent display of fruits, curds, that's yoghurt to you and me, hot plate of everything spicy and eggs in shells being gently warmed and me standing like a plank wondering, what should I eat? Because I'd not eaten in this country ever before and advice before I left was basically don't eat and drink anything that has not been blasted with radiation to spray, kill bugs or you will die. Food in a hotel couldn't kill me, could it? So I chose fruit and prayed it had not been washed in a stream. Some bread, which hopefully had not been made with any water, or chicken, and a couple of eggs that hopefully were not chicken or raw on the inside, along with a couple of spoonfuls of stuff. Basically, I did not have a clue. The breakfast was superb, once I'd sorted myself out. Along with coffee thick enough to put a new sole on my boots, I was well and truly stuffed, so back to my room and wait. And wait. And did I say, uh, wait? Nobody had been in touch since I'd landed, and I'm here without a clue what to do. So back up to my room to clean my teeth, making sure I only used bottled water, and tidied up a bit. Putting on my only footwear, boots, I went downstairs wondering when someone would be in touch. The only methods of getting in touch was Skype, of this phone number that looked just like a bunch of numbers because it wasn't working on my phone, that was for sure. So I sat on a sofa in the lobby, in the grand lobby with staff nodding and smiling as they passed. The reception was to my right and pillars of marble reached for the sky in front of me. I could get an internet signal, so kept trying Skype, all to no avail, until I got so frustrated I was now pacing around the lobby. However, later in the morning, around 11am, I managed to get in touch with someone who said a taxi would arrive shortly. There are obviously two interpretations of something will happen shortly in this world. My shortly, as in five to ten minutes, and the Indian shortly which could be, as I was to discover many times, sometime that day. It was an hour and a half later that the taxi turned up. It was the same chap who brought me from the airport to the hotel, and I was already looking to our laughing conversation. We set off for the office somewhere in the district of Gagon. The traffic, oh my God almighty. I thought the traffic was bad at midnight, but what I was witnessing now was just sheer and total chaos. Cars, motorbikes, buses, pedal cycles, vans and tuk-tuks, all trying to be on the same piece of road. I was going to say tarmac, but I'm not so sure if tarmac has arrived in India just yet. Yes, there are rules for the roads, 
but all are ignored. There is overtaking on the left, right, and I'm very surprised there was no attempt to go over the top or even underneath. The traffic continued to make me laugh, along with my driver, who was just smiling until eventually, after many U-turns, winding down of windows and conversations, we arrived outside this building. The buildings in Gagon are born in the middle of a barren land like a rocky dust, sprouting up with many buildings, just high-rise blocks of flats with holes in the walls where windows may be going. So many unfinished, but obviously the basis for the blocks of offices I could see. Were these buildings just breeze blocks with a covering of plaster to make them look complete? Are the building regulations the same as driving on the road laws of, well, that'll do? I was ejected from the taxi at the door of this building, having gone through security gates and people checking to make sure you have authority to go through the gates. Let me point out about security, in my opinion. There is security just about everywhere, from scanners at the entrance of every hotel I experienced, every entrance to office buildings, and I even saw a gate, like you see at an airport you walk through to check you have nothing metal on you. This gate was in the middle of nowhere, in front of a shopping complex, with no fences either side, just this security gate. People were not even taking any notice of it, it was just walking into the shopping area. It was nuts. Having been left at the entrance door of this office block, I walked in to see a reception desk and a young girl behind that smiled at me. I had better ask the girl in reception, I thought, using my universal Indian where I needed to go, and she just pointed towards the lift. I got into the lift, proceeding up to the floor I was told the office was on. Exiting the lift on the floor I was told, I walked to discover a sign in the wall saying where the office was. I had arrived. Yippee! Now, consider this. The only communication I had prior to this moment in time was a couple of emails, a Skype call from a chap called Sarthak, a message on LinkedIn, along with the taxi driver at the airport, plus a few people at the hotel, and that was it. I had no clue whatsoever who the owner was, what this was really all about, and here I was in an office building, full of small businesses, in a country four and a half thousand miles from home and just about to walk through a door. I do recall thinking to myself standing outside this office door, I must be mad, and wondering if my kidnappers would be nice and hoping the knife they will cut my throat with would be sharp. Oh well, here goes, it's been a reasonable life. I pushed the door open and, hey presto. Chapter 4 It is wedding season and I was trapped. Hey Kevin, someone said in my direction, you've arrived. Is everything okay for you? Please sit in the meeting room and we will join you shortly. We all know what shortly in India means, don't we, boys and girls? So here I was in an office with eight other people of slightly different colour skin to mine, and as soon as I walk in, I am directed to a side office called the meeting room. The office was fairly basic, with desks on which laptops were being stared at, and the partitions to make separate offices being made from glass. It didn't feel like I stuck out like a sore thumb at all. No, not me. The very idea, I thought. I looked like an albino fish in a very large fish tank. That was the furthest thing from my mind. Oh, and the main comment was, You are a big guy, aren't you? I hope the bike will be okay. Sitting down in the meeting room and seeing small bottles of water... The first thing I did was grab one, twist the top and glug down its contents, as I was so thirsty, and I mean thirsty, thirstier than a lizard in a very hot desert, ready for whatever lay ahead. There I was in this office meeting room drinking my water, with glass partition walls in front, also to my left and to my right. 
looking out into the main office trying to work out what was going on. I had discovered the night before I left England I was going to be the only white man. In fact, not the only white man, but also the only person from outside India who was going to be doing this trip for the very first time ever. Visions of me buried up to my neck in sand with ants feasting on my eyeballs as my motorbike roared off into the distance flashed into my mind. Santosh, who I discovered was his name, with a huge white beaming smile came into the room, sat down across the table in front of me and started to tell me all about the situation and what lay ahead. Out popped my iPhone, covered it with a microphone cover and I recorded what was said. I'm pleased I did, because even though he spoke perfect English, I was having a challenge understanding him because of his Indian accent. This didn't matter because shortly afterwards, BB, short for Biswaru Banerjee, thankfully, the business owner turned up, and I was starting to feel like a white chocolate Maltese in a bag of brown ones. They both started to explain what lay ahead for the next 10 to 12 days with incredible exciting comments of thank you for coming, it is going to be amazing, you will love what we are doing and where we are going, etc, etc. Hey, maybe this won't be too bad after all. And there was not one throat slitting knife in sight. Winner! After around 20 minutes, I was asked to follow the two of them to see their brand new Ducati scramblers. Off we went down a lift into the car park underneath the office block. I'm thinking, this is when they're going to grab me. And they introduced me to their bright yellow stunning Ducati scramblers that we'll be riding on our adventure. I sat on one because they were concerned I would be too big to ride one and said, yep, that's okay. The next time I would see them would be the following morning. Little did I know at the time that if it hadn't been for these scramblers, the journey wouldn't have been so much fun. Back up to the office, a few more words and off I went for lunch with Santosh and another chap whose name escapes me. Back out of the office building, walked to the main road to hail a taxi and with so many cars with other forms of transport beeping for survival, it was just bonkers. Eventually, a car arrived. It was my laughing driver. He's a popular chap. To be transported to an Indian restaurant. Well, I guess it would be Indian, wouldn't it? Before going into the shopping complex that also includes eating places, we had to go through this security scanner that stood alone in the middle of nowhere, which just seemed pointless, really. I asked why it was there, with hardly anyone going through it, and the answer made my ears prick up. It was there due to terrorist attacks and to help prevent them. In my mind, I thought there was not a cat in hell's chance of it doing that because you could just walk past it anyway, but said nothing. The restaurant we went to, I discovered, would have full spicy Indian food that for the equivalent of four pounds, you could eat until you burst. The food just kept coming, with starters of small bits of char-grilled chicken, fish, vegetables and mutton on skewers laid across a hot char-grill that they had placed into the holes in the table. It just never stopped, until I said I'm bursting now. So then it stopped. Then there was the main course. You what? The main course? Really? I looked over my left shoulder to see shiny metal pots of food with rice and so many different curries, offerings and aromas, it was unbelievable. Yeah, I will try some for sure. Well, it was rude not to, wasn't it? Following lunch, it was decided I should be taken into Delhi to experience some culture, as this was a day for me to adjust and settle into my new surroundings. That is if I could walk after such a lunch feast. The experience will never leave my memory of that, you can be assured. Out of the restaurant and... Taxi! Guess who? Off to Delhi, it was to see the sights. Along to experience the sounds and smells. 
I mentioned before about laughing at the traffic at midnight and even more so during my morning excursion to the office. Delhi. Well, that was another level altogether because up until now what I had witnessed was just child's play. Pure and utter unadulterated chaos is the best way to describe what I was witnessing. How there were no massive pile-ups and dead people lying on the side of the road I just cannot fathom. That is what was also spectacular about it. There were no accidents, no bumps, scrapes, deaths or anything at all. But from my point of view it was just mad. So much traffic, so many people and more interesting than anywhere I had ever been or seen before. It was brilliant. The first port of call was to a statue in central Delhi, where the volume of people was just staggering. We managed to get parked and walked towards the entrance to discover being a white man. The entrance fee was shocking. It was four times more, in comparison to Indian nationals. I wonder what would happen if we did the same in Britain. The statue was Kwitab Minar, which is a soaring 73 metre high tower of victory, built in 1193, by Kutab Uddin Abak, immediately after the defeat of Delhi's last Hindu kingdom. The tower has five distinct stories, each marked by a projecting balcony, and tapers from 15 metre diameter at the base to just two and a half metres at the top. The first three storeys are made of red sandstone. The fourth and fifth storeys are of marble and sandstone. The origins of Kwitab Minar are shrouded in controversy. Some believe it was erected as a tower of victory to signify the beginning of the Muslim rule in India. Others say it served as a minaret to the Muslims to call the faithful to prayer. No one can, however, dispute that the tower is not one of the finest monuments in India. We chose not to go in due to the extortionate price I was going to be charged, so off to the next location, which would be India Gate. India Gate was absolutely stunning and the history just blew me away. At the centre of New Delhi stands the 42 metre high India Gate, an Arc de Triomphe, like the archway in the middle of a crossroad. Almost similar to its French counterpart, it commemorates 70,000 Indian soldiers who lost their lives fighting for the British Army during World War I. The memorial bears the names of more than 13,516 British and Indian soldiers killed in the northwestern frontier of the Afghan War of 1919. The foundation stone of India Gate was laid by His Royal Highness, the Duke of Connaught, in 1921, and it was designed by Edwin Lutyens. The monument was dedicated to the nation ten years later by the then Viceroy, Lord Irwin. During nightfall, India Gate is a dramatically floodlit where the fountains nearby make a lovely display with coloured lights. India Gate stands at one end of Rajpath, and the area surrounding it is generally referred to as India Gate. After gawping around India Gate being offered tea, toys with things dangling on a stick and asked so many times, please buy sir, along with reading inscriptions that were so plentiful it was impossible to read them all, it was time to return to my hotel. I feel sure you could spend days just in New Delhi exploring the history, heritage and discovering more stories that could rightfully be written in a book. What we didn't know heading back to Gagon was wedding season was now in full flow that resulted in us being stuck in traffic. Some 25,000 weddings a day were taking place. 25,000 men led to their doom. And we had landed right in the middle of one of them. 
There was not a thing we could do, but let me tell you, even though the traffic was at a standstill with no prospect of moving a millimetre, this did not prevent a gazillion vehicle drivers, cars, tuk-tuks, buses, etc., from sitting on their horns, because they must have been sitting on them as their wrists would have worn out if they'd done by hand. Shut up! Eventually we managed to edge our way through and after some time returned to the Palazzo Hotel, where the following morning I would meet everyone going on this adventure, be getting my leg over a Ducati scrambler and riding along roads where my only concern was staying alive. There was only one issue, and that was having to massage my cheeks from the thoughts I was having. Due to smiling so much, my cheeks ached. Chapter 5 Let the adventure begin. Oh shit. Day 1 Welcome to Rajasthan. The desert of five kingdoms that will change your life forever. Day 1 So, I find myself awakening to another beautiful, gorgeous, exciting morning where I jump into my glass-walled shower with my bits presented to the world without a care. Making sure, of course, I keep my lips tight shut along with my eyes squeezed shut to prevent shower water from entering my system and deli belly. Opening my curtains and looking outside while standing naked liberates the soul. Put a smile on my face and certainly scares the hell out of the natives. Dressed and with a hop, skip and jump along the corridor, down the lift and sliding my way to breakfast. After all, I'm now an experienced Indian hotel breakfast selection eater. Hard-boiled eggs, fruits, coffee, cakes and pastries to make the day start with a hearty drumbeat. Making my way to the table, a couple of the other riders had arrived and I was introduced. But nothing seemed to be organised. I was okay meeting people I'd never met before. That did not cause an issue. But it seemed time to get a grip and sort stuff out. Breakfast finished and three cups of thick, gorgeous coffee later. Well, could be a long day, you know. I shot back upstairs to finish packing. Everyone had finally arrived and it must be time to beep beep. Back downstairs before the lift had time to realise it had just taken me up and ta-da! I was ready. Well, I was ready. Did I mention I was ready? The people I had met allow me to introduce. Shumi, a motorbike journalist, TV star in India. More on this cheeky devil later. Whose real name is... Well, I can't even pronounce it. Good job his name is Shumi. He's famous throughout India. So I found out. Yep, Shumi will do for me. Parakram, another motorbike journalist whose riding gear consisted of a jacket, helmet, gloves, normal shoes and strapping protecting his knees over his jeans. Very interesting. There are only five of us riding with BB, Santosh, Two journalists and a white man. Or as I like to put it, a white rose between thorns. Just don't let them know I said that, OK? Outside we go and the Ducatis in their splendid yellow are positioned for taking off along with the support vehicle. Let me point out, just in case I forget later, the driver of the support vehicle was from another planet. We had difficulty sometimes getting through traffic on motorbikes and then sometimes after doing so pulled into the side of the road for a chat or rest and this driver would arrive seconds later. How the hell did he do it in a people carrier? Was the people carrier a blasted helicopter in disguise? I could never fathom out how he kept up because to me it was impossible. I walked off to do my bit to camera on a stick and then get ready for riding along with everyone else. Getting on my bike we ride for a couple of yards and stop to pose for photographs. Then 
we're off. Allow me to explain something here, and please recall what you have read about the traffic I had witnessed. And I'd been in a car, wondering how I was going to survive. I was now about to launch myself into traffic on a motorbike that was underpowered compared to my 1300cc back home, which I'd only just started up for the first time and ridden eight yards for static photographs. Here I was about to ride on a road called the National Highway, where the death rate on this stretch of road made the highest death rate in the world. Then, oh boy, then, set off across the car park and down a short exit road to the crossroads with things coming left, right, straight on with looks on their faces. Let's kill the white man! Even though they couldn't see the colour of my skin, I was wearing full held riding gear and a black visor was down. BB set off and bless him he did look back to see where I was and I'm sure to make sure I was following. We exited the Palazzo Hotel and oh my God. Here is the situation. I had two choices. It was either ride as I do in Britain, defensively, and get killed, or ride like I am in the film Mad Max and beat them at their own game. Luckily, I chose the second option as I found myself shooting down a road, overtaking traffic on the left, twisting open the throttle and heading straight for a tree growing in the middle of the road, swerving to miss that and discovered by saying to myself, hang on just a minute. This bike is very powerful, can leave other vehicles behind in my cloud of dust. A smile returned to my face and I very quickly relaxed that it wasn't all that bad. Well, when I say it was not that bad, what I was to witness soon made my arse start to chew the seat. The roads just end and become dust-covered rocks. Or there are potholes big enough to swallow the moon along with repairs being done by people in normal clothes and the only warning is a brick in the road, or maybe some twigs. Honestly, it's bloody fabulous. On to the National Highway and very quickly into a fuel station to make sure there was enough fuel to reach Jaipur. Then, very quickly again, back into the National Highway heading south. Then, a traffic jam from hell. It appeared with so many horns beeping, Traffic just pulling in front of me from left and right, it was shocking. So much so, it was one of the only times I was grateful to be wearing a bag on my belly to poo. Or I'd have shit myself. Just keep edging forward, I told myself, and not being used to the bike as I had not ridden a mile yet, kept stalling the bike, adding to the frustration. In the fuel station, however, Shumi had warned me to use my horn, as it is expected to warn drivers you are there. Welcome to me and my horn. I shall leave your imagination to make an image. I latched onto the back of Santosh and we made our way through the traffic. Eventually, after around 30 minutes of pushing the wheel ahead and getting in front, we reached the toll gates. Free for bikes, as we can ride down the side without having to wait in the gigantic queues. The feeling of relief afterwards was amazing. How was I still alive? I laughed. You know that laugh where you better laugh or you'd collapse into a jabbering heap? Everyone caught up and we were off. Beep beep. Shumi set off like a bullet from a gun and I thought to myself, You think you can leave the white man behind? Oh, really? Twisting my Ducati throttle and I was off after him like a bullet, quickly catching him and learning very quickly from his riding style you can do almost anything you want. As regards overtaking, let the games begin. Cars and trucks, well, especially trucks go so slow and alter directions so slowly, I couldn't see a problem or worries. Apart from discovering very quickly there are vehicles coming towards you on the same side of the road as you're on, with a smile as if to say, what's your problem? Never mind that bit because cows are sacred in India and can go wherever they wish which meant in the middle of the road, walking into the road, but more likely just standing there looking at you as if to say, I double dare you, white man. 
touch me. Go on. I dare you. This way of travelling was absolutely tremendous. Just twist the throttle and hold on. I found it thrilling. I mean, what was there to worry about? Just follow Shumi, or even overtake him when he was caught behind a truck shooting past and thinking, I bet he thinks white man, eh? After several miles, well, actually more than several miles, we pulled into a coffee shop, where Santosh came up to me and asked if I'd ever ridden in India before. I was expecting a telling off. To which I said, no, first time ever, first day ever. He then went on to tell me he thought it was fucking marvellous and walked away laughing. After 20 minutes we got back on the bikes and I was stopped by an Indian asking for a photograph with me and my bike, which I was happy to oblige him and his beaming smile as he showed off to his travelling companions. It's tough being famous, you know. Off we went, not too far, and stopped at another. Stop that I can only describe as their equivalent of our motorway cafe. This is where I had for the first time a drink called Lassie. This cooling yoghurt drink it is utterly scrummy, as anyone who has thrown caution and advice about only drinking sealed bottles of water to the wind will testify. Creamy and sweet, sour, sometimes salty, sometimes subtly spiced, and nevertheless utterly bloody gorgeous. Lassie is served in a clear drinking vessel with lumps of yoghurt floating in it. It is, without doubt, something you just have to try. I then took part in a competition to shoot small balloons with an air gun at a games area of the stop. And the less said about how I did there, the better. I let them win, honestly. Ish. The heat I had discovered in my riding suit was unbelievable once I stopped and I was already looking forward to riding again for some relief and to get some air to cool down my inner swimming pool. Off again on my wasp and continued down the National Highway for a couple of more hours. The road journey was quite uneventful once I got used to the traffic, roads coming to an end and animals just stood there daring you to touch. I would go as far as to say it was bloody good fun doing what I wanted to do, riding fast and just shooting past other vehicles any way I saw fit. Santosh had taken the lead and without much warning slowed down and did a U-turn up a dirt track. With everyone doing their best to follow him without being hit by other traffic, up the dirt track to a parking area. Pulled up, side stands down and off the bikes while Santos disappeared down the side of a building, returning shortly afterwards explaining I would be charged a fortune to enter this facility. So again it was decided to continue on to our first stopover. Eventually reaching our destination, which was not much further for the night. This was the luxurious Le Beau Fort Resort. Adjoining Amer Fort, within the grounds were individual lodges looking like square tents, but were so much more than tents, that's for sure. We pulled up through the gate and rode down to the main reception building, parking outside. We were in a line and I was now getting tired of my jaw hitting the ground from the sheer wow factors. Nearby was the original Delhi gate, which was used to be the gateway for all trade moving in and out of Jaipur to Delhi, not that long ago. On arrival, it took a little time to allocate lodges, and off we went, walking towards them. What an absolute fabulous place, even made even more so by my room on entering. Pure luxury, once more. Once we had settled in, a feast was prepared late afternoon on tables with sparkling white tablecloths and food enough to feed the 5,000. During this time, I wandered off to do some filming, with Shumi shouting, Oh, look, it's a white man with a selfie stick. Cheeky bugger. And it was also the same time I saw my first real live mongoose. Now, mongoose. That means cobra snakes. Or at least it did in my mind. And whilst walking through the grass and sandy area, you can guess what was going through my mind. Snake! Talk about tiptoe through the grass is an understatement. 
Back to my lodge to relax and brush up from the day's riding. The bathroom was pure brown, speckled and white striped marble that gave you a feeling of being very special indeed. With a sunken bath ready to dive into. Relax and just smile. That night, after relaxing, we ate outside amongst the canvas-covered lodge rooms that were standing in the grounds like elephants spaced straight as a regimental parade, with the rooms offering pure luxury, large bay windows with light-filtering curtains and a high roof that recedes in a slope, forming a canopy over the bed. Food was plentiful, and eating by firelight with candles on the table, covered by a sky packed with sparkling diamonds. India was already grabbing my heart and squeezing tightly. However, this night finished for me rather different than I had hoped. I was to wake up with a shock to discover my poo bag had split, and you can guess what was covering everywhere. Looking back, it was probably because I had slept naked and my bag had become trapped as I turned during sleep and it had ripped open. But I had indeed also developed an interesting tummy problem. So I cleaned up as much as I could manage and back to sleep until around 6am. What was I going to have to say? This was my first adventure morning and I was already having to talk poo to the boss man. Chapter 6 Is there a doctor in the house? Day 2 Well, as you heard earlier, my night did not end in the way I would have preferred, in that during the night my bag had exploded like a direct hit on a baked bean factory, absolutely everywhere. What I couldn't understand, during the last three days I was eating everything I could lay my hands on, from spicy everything to the dreaded chicken. Was it actually chicken? Fish? Mutton? Rice? And making sure I only drank bottled water, so this came as a bit of a shock, I can tell you. Having risen, again, and cleaned up as much as possible, I stripped the bed, washed the mattress, and made the best job I could do so the cleaners did not die from fright on entering. From either the smell or the sight. I went to breakfast and wondered what I was going to say. Being the first person there, my mind was cluttered with how this was going to be taken. BB arrived and I managed to take him to one side and explain. Having done so, I was amazed just how laid back BB was about the whole thing. My bag was filling up quickly with what can only be described as muddy water, so I knew it was serious. I recall thinking I must keep my fluid intake up or I could end up being in a very dangerous position. This had happened a few years before, resulting in my brother taking me to a hospital while I lay in the back of my car. On arrival into the hospital, they took my blood and I was told I was on the cusp of liver failure due to losing so much fluid. As you can imagine, I was worried this could happen whilst here. It was decided best not to ride, but to continue in the support vehicle. This meant I was in a position to empty or change my bag without having to undress my motorbike clothing to do so. I was absolutely devastated. It was worked out later it must have been the masala peanuts or the mutton because others suffered too, although not as bad as I did, I'm pleased to say. This presented a problem, because this left a Ducati without a rider. Plus, there was no trailer to put the bike on anyway. Day two consisted of sitting in the support vehicle, constantly, well, every hour or so, changing my bag. I have an ileostomy or permanent bag on my belly as I had all of my large colon removed in the year 2000. Taking the bag off and flinging it into the undergrowth or desert, I can assure you 100% my DNA is scattered in Rajasthan. I was not going to put the bag into the disposal bag and place it into the support vehicle as the stench was putrid, to say the least. 
I was drinking sachets of replacement salt from Digvijay in litre bottles of water along with Imodium I had taken to India myself just in case to try and slow things down. Unfortunately, they didn't. And on arrival at the hotel in Bikinar, there was a doctor waiting for me. That was an experience, I can tell you. More on that later. Back to the start of day two, anyway. And having told BB about my situation, it was agreed I wouldn't ride today and that a chap by the name of Digvijay from Jaipur, just down the road, was to ride my bike whilst I sat in the support vehicle feeling sorry for myself. Later that day, there was to be another passenger in the support vehicle, but for a totally different reason. However, what I did discover was I could learn more about where I was and what I was seeing when driving than I ever would on the Ducati. In the support vehicle was our adventure photographer by the name of Rohit Kumar, who was a pot of gold information. You see... Every cloud has a silver lining, because everything happens for a reason. Along the way towards Bikinar, we came across a salt flat called Sambar Lake, that having first gone along single track roads covered in talcum powder sand, it's the only way I can describe the sand because it's so fine and soft, with hidden rocks dispersed within it to twist your front wheel and make your bum chew your seat to keep a grip. All of a sudden, we were on the side of this dried-up salt flats in the middle of nowhere, with mile after mile of absolutely nothing. There was, I discovered, 13 miles of flat, open, dried-up, crusty lake to the front, right and left of us. The guys chose to have a play blasting over the salt lake, and even I got out to have a quick ride and pose for a photograph. It was absolutely amazing, as I'd never seen anything like this, with a stunning clear blue bright sky, as far as the eye could see, without a cloud, joined on the horizon by the grey carpet of the salt flats. This is a sight that will stay in my memory forever. Back in the support vehicle I jumped, after taking the opportunity to change, uh, <clears throat> you know what, and the chaps shot off across the flats, disappearing into the distance when... Spludge! They rode straight into a patch of salty crust covered glutinous mud. The salt flat was not as dry as it seemed. This mud was just awful, thick, sticky, smelly, bike chain destroying stuff. The mud went right up to the bike frame, wrapping itself around suspension, rear wheel, chain and sprocket, grinding all the bikes to a halt. It was so thick, and the stench! The mud was just impossible to remove, despite the efforts of our plastic bag-covered hands, feet, sticks, it was glutinous gunk that would not move. So tools to continue riding, hopefully. Let me tell you that, yes, it did dry. But it dried as it had on the lake bed, with the crust leaving the mud still moist underneath. It was to take another three days until it dried, bit by bit, to take most of it off. And we still took some back attached to the bikes, nine days and 1,500 kilometres later. On our way towards Bikinar, the timings had got a bit wrong. Well, actually a lot wrong. Because still some two hours from the city, it had become dark. The roads we were on just did not want to be riding on them in the dark, for a couple of reasons, really. There was the state of the roads with the tarmac, well, what tarmac there was, which just ended without warning to become the soft talcum powder with hidden rocks and stones. You didn't want to be riding at night because lights are optional, or at least it seemed that way. So many trucks, cars, buses, and animals didn't bother having lights at night, or maybe the light bulbs had blown and not been replaced. You just came across, out of the darkness, the back of a vehicle, if you were lucky. Or if unlucky, the front heading directly towards you. Then, of course, you had the wandering, sacred cows standing in the middle of the road, 
or walking into the road, and they certainly had no light. Thank the Lord for my pooly tum-tum. Driving along these roads had me wondering how I would have felt riding the Ducati, and how long it would have been until I was seriously injured or even killed. The bikes had shot off into the distance hoping to get to our next location quickly. Then we came across the bikes that pulled over. We stopped and went to discover why, which enabled me to change my bag yet again. More DNA in the sands of India. What we discovered was shocking, especially because the bikes we were riding. Shumi had hit a pothole in the dark that was so bad the rear wheel had smashed, just about in half, leaving the Ducati unrideable. But not only that, you don't call the AA or the RAC in the middle of India. Plan B, recovery. Grab someone with an empty truck and pay them to take you to the city, which is exactly what happened. This is what you call damn clever and taught me a lesson. We had continued on to Bikinar in the dark, and when I say dark, it was pitch black. Out of the blackness appear vehicles without lights, like ghosts shooting towards us, and more frightening were the animals, namely cows, just standing there refusing to move. They were obviously more used to this madness than I was. Not only did we have to contend with this, but the road, on a frequent basis, just disappeared to become this talcum powder dust. Being in the car, we were on our mission to reach the hotel, because the doctor had been arranged to meet me due to my tummy trouble. Reaching Bikana, eventually, we were going round and round, wondering where this hotel was, asking several people along the roadside if they knew. I recall thinking if I had been riding in the dark, I would have been petrified. And then on reaching Bikana, had I become separated from the others, I would be completely lost. All part of the adventure. Finding this place was an adventure in itself, battling cars, directions and the bright lights of other hotels. This is where my imagination was running wild, because I was thinking the hotel must be a rundown shack because nobody seemed to know where it was. Eventually, looming between the trees and lighting up the sky, the hotel came into view. Driving down this very long driveway to arrive at the entrance. Oh my God, what an entrance. It was like a palace. I found out later it actually had been a palace. With a huge arched entrance, staff galore outside helping us. At the same time, it also had an age about it from a time gone by with huge doors at the entrance, with massive brass handles to grab hold of. On entering, the reception was on my left with several staff waiting to greet us, but at this stage we had arrived some two hours later than we had mentioned. Doctors in India are paid for appointments, so I have no idea what his issue was with us being late. But on being presented to him and his assistant, Mr Doctor wasn't very impressed at all. I sat next to him and he asked me to explain my situation. I explained what had happened and that I had an ileostomy which made me concerned for my well-being because during the day I had filled my bag numerous times as it was just filling with speckled water. I was worried I may have become dehydrated. He then asked me more questions and had asked me to say them again because I did not understand his English Indian accent. Then, and then, believe it or not, he asked me a question, and I replied, I'm sorry I don't understand. To my surprise, he said quite forcefully, Do you not understand English? The cheeky twat, I nearly nutted him. Things went downhill from there as he took an instant dislike to me. He continued and eventually examined me when he discovered my poo bag. What is this? he asked with me thinking I'd just explained to him I had an ileostomy, the bloody idiot. 
This proved he had no clue what he was on about. His assistant, who was sitting there as some form of servant, the class system in India is very prominent, took my blood pressure, followed by the doctor pressing his fingers into my tummy area. When he finished with his examination, he gave me a form with medication required and just walked off, not giving me a chance to ask any questions at all. I discovered later, in all my travels, that if an Indian believes he is a class above you, there is no chit-chat, and basically it is as if, how dare you be in my presence? This left me very worried about the medication he had recommended to take. Anyway, we managed to get him back and got Rohit, the photographer, to get involved, so he could understand for me. I was given sachets of anti-death tablets of anti-squirt and smaller tablets of anti-spew, or at least that's what I thought. In my thought, he could have given me sachets of death, tablets of comfort and smaller tablets of quick decomposing body. He assured Rohit they were correct and I was also informed no riding of motorbikes for another two to three days and certainly only very light food like curd, which is a yoghurt. My cup runneth over with joys of joys. Motorbike adventure to be spent in a people carrier with the driver from hell. Well, not exactly hell, he was just nuts. The hotel. Oh my goodness, the hotel. It was off the planet. The Lakshmi Niwas Palace had bedrooms with ceilings reaching towards the sky, with massive four poster beds. The bathrooms, however, were well, slightly challenged because the water for the shower must have been coming from Middle Earth through pipes that were hundreds of years old that rattled and made me chuckle as I ran around the shower, hoping to get wet. On exploring more of this amazing building, rooftop terraces were discovered. A central open-air courtyard surrounded by individual rooms with a billion stars as our ceiling. On this building exploring adventure, there was a room, a snooker room, where the walls were adorned with animal skins, which took me by surprise. Massive tiger skins, lion skins and crocodile skins adorned the walls, showing off their splendour. It had me thinking of a time long gone where the British had travelled into jungles and killed these poor defenceless creatures from atop an elephant, no doubt. I actually found it quite shocking, but at the same time fascinating how big these magnificent beasts had been. A different world with a different outlook on life from a different period and in time long gone. I was informed this palace had been used many times for state events many years ago and the walls were covered in photographs of parades full of elephants with their bodies covered in spectacular fabrics and gleaming jewels. Also Lord Mountbatten had once stayed and photographs were testament to this event. The British had arrived in their droves acting like they ruled the universe and the Indian population must bow to their every desire. I find it strange, since British rule ended quite some time ago, it is the Indian people who are now taking over their world with their desire for success, and most certainly their desire to entertain and showcase their wonderful country to the world. The night passed without any events, thankfully. Waking in this bedroom was just special making me feel like royalty yet again. Going down for breakfast, well, what breakfast I was allowed, was serene with gorgeous sparkling blue cloudless sky above the courtyard, with that morning fresh chill that makes your skin tingle and your hairs rise. Chapter 7 I saw the Milky Way for the very first time. Day 3 The morning was very slow and genteel due to sorting out the damaged bike from the day before. 
and sorting out the plan for continuing this adventure. It had been arranged, due to me not trusting the doctor, to speak with a consultant back in Delhi. In doing so, I was informed the medication was, in fact, correct, and often prescribed when people were caught in terrible floods, which brings awful disease. So with my mind settled, I felt great, even though the consultant reiterated, no riding for a couple of days. Once everyone had been fed, the morning continued with a relaxed feeling, photographs being posed for, along with them taking of the hotel and the grounds. I was in absolute paradise and enjoying every single second. Day three continues. A short day travelling to the Manvar Desert Camp. A desert camp, eh? Oh well, I guess I'm looking forward to seeing cobras, scorpions and maybe the odd camel sharing my bed. However, this was going to be day two in the support vehicle, under doctor's orders to rest another three days. That ain't happening, I thought. Not another three days. So we started slightly late due to the wheel issue the night before and also my tum-tum troubles, along to placing the bikes out in front of the hotel for photo opportunities by everyone. This day was all about really taking our time, enjoying the ride, and trying to find some sand dunes to have some fun. Also, now in the car was Digvijay. Due to being a bike down, having had Shumi wreck one of the bikes, not by looking where he was going in the dark, note to Shumi, eat more carrots. So desert camp, here we come. However, I now had two guides in the support car telling me all sorts of stories along the route. Now one of the things which I was getting somewhat impressed by was the driver of the car. Why? I hear you ask. Allow me to explain. We had Ducatis shooting off into the distance, overtaking everything that came upon and in effect leaving us for dust. Oh no, they were not because we had the driver who sits on the left side of the devil himself, who thought he was driving a very fast tank. No matter what traffic he faced, he was never more than five minutes behind the bikes. And I mean no matter what the traffic. He was worse than nuts and made me laugh out loud. Along the way, we did, in fact, come across some sand dunes, an oasis surrounded by sand dunes in the middle of absolutely nowhere. There was this small lake full of water in the middle of this area of sand. Photograph opportunity! And me a chance to get out of the car, stretch my legs and do my bit to camera. I'm sure you'll also be pleased to know my tummy no longer had any issues. The amount that had come out of me during yesterday I'm sure it would take four days to uh, <clears throat> fill back up. This oasis was a super distraction from not just riding along the roads looking at dust and chuckling away at the road conditions, but it was in its own right a minuscule piece of paradise. Having gone along the road a bit further off into more sand dunes, now, boys and girls, can you remember reading about the sand? You know, the talcum powder sand. The more I realise, the more I think it has been made to swallow motorbikes. And probably people. This is exactly what happened. Not just once, but twice. Taking three of us to lift BB's bike out of a deep rut he'd made having fun. Spinning his back wheel shooting sand across the world. Digging its own trench and then looking despondent when the bike wouldn't come out. He. And off he went, leaving me to walk 27 million miles back to the car. Oh, OK. Maybe not 27 million. Moving towards Manvar a little further to discover another sand dune, and having not learned any lessons whatsoever, we went up the track to find a spot that was... How shall I put this? Right out of a film set. The photograph that Rohit took is going on my wall for a memory to last a lifetime. God damn it was a special place. High up with super views over the desert. I'm surprised no flies landed in my wide open mouth because I was in awe 
of this amazing location. Having rested a while, we headed off to Manvar Desert Camp, where, on arrival, we had to take our kit from the support vehicles and place it into the jeeps. Because that is how we were being taken to the camp right in the middle of the desert, via 4x4. Although the bikes were to follow the jeeps too. I had no idea what to expect whatsoever. Although I'd seen pictures, nothing did them justice for what I was about to see. As the desert camp jeeps pulled into camp, there were camels. But there was also a guide telling me that the toilet was a bush for number ones and twos. So I'd best be quick to choose my uh, bush. Oh, OK. Let's make fun of the white money. Eh? Yes, they got me good and proper. Going into my tent, I found the toilet and actually thought it was a dummy one just for sure. That night, as the sun went down... Chapter 8 Wow. Simply wow. Day 4 Oh, so I'm still in my red polo shirt and you can guess why, so there's no reason to explain. We awoke to the wonderful setting on the desert camp, had a shower in the make-believe bathroom area, bloody bush, and I placed the spare soaps into my rucksack. Just as a souvenir, you understand. And not the first place to gift me soaps, either. I had a great breakfast of curd, a gorgeous, very basic yoghurt-type product that I wish I could get in England, along with toast and some scrambled egg. The reason I'm not riding today is the last two days had really taken it out of me, so I was actually feeling a little bit weak. Wimp. Our aim today was to get down to Jodhpur and explore this fort thingy and surrounding town. As there wasn't a great deal to do on the way, plus it was only 109 kilometres away. The support vehicle was packed with me inside and off we went. We stopped a couple of times along the way for drinks, but to all purposes we reached the outskirts of Jodhpur and the traffic began. It is quite apparent that whilst there are rules on how to drive in India, Nobody takes a blind bit of notice, as there are 1.4 billion people, and I guess around seven policemen. So if you get caught, then the gods have wished it upon you. We started to drive down the back streets of Jodhpur that was barely wider than the car, with traffic coming both ways. I sat in the back thinking we had definitely gone the wrong way, when... In the middle of all the mayhem and madness appears this hotel like a mirage. Absolute stunning hotel, right outside the gate, being pure squalor. This wasn't the first time I would feel this way either. We had arrived at the Ras Haveli, and what I was about to experience simply took my breath away with its pure beauty, location, staff and the view from my room was out of a book of fairy tales. Then it was to get better. We had lunch, planning to walk up the hill to the fort. My only footwear being my former adventure boots. Must say they were like slippers now, so comfortable. Oh, and only one other thing I needed. An oxygen tank to help me breathe as we climbed. Off we went through the back gate, and up, and up, and up, and up, up. I was waiting for clouds to appear around my neck. Arriving at the fort was a sight and experience I shall never, ever forget. The fort. Meherangar, the fort of Jodhpur. Crowns a rocky hill that rises 400 feet above the surrounding plain and appears both to command and to blend with the landscape. One of the largest forts in Rajasthan, it contains some of the finest palaces and its museum along with many priceless relics of Indian courtly life. The fort and its palaces were built in a period of 500 years following the foundation in the mid-15th century. As a result, the varied building styles of many different periods are represented. 
The view over Jodhpur was simply breathtaking. I truly was in heaven. Or at least I was until the chilli bomb was consumed later that night. What I mean about the chilli bomb, that is what I nicknamed it. After we had been around the fort learning things from this amazing guide, we chose to walk around the market town, having first abseiled down the cliff face, in other words, the path we just walked up, back to our hotel. The market just seemed to go on forever, where I'm sure you could buy anything from a chilli seed to a fighter jet, with stalls and open-fronted shops that went on for miles, packed to the hilt with people everywhere. We walked around, and as was his wont, or it always seemed to be, Santosh decided to have something to eat. Now at this stage, I still wasn't eating very much except curd and roti or toast, so I was forbidden to have the massive chilli, sweet chilli, so they said, stuffed with a potato-type mix, and then deep-fried so it puffed up. Well, let me tell you, all I saw were these three chaps, Santosh, Digvijay and Rohit, bite into these things and start to sweat. Then sweat a bit more. Then beads of glistening sweat appeared on their faces. Laugh? Well, I laughed that much I was nearly sick. And they were from this country as well, so God knows what would have happened to me. Another fine result from a pooly tum-tum. Anyway, hence the name from now on, Chilli Bomb. Returning back to the hotel and making sure everything that needed charging was plugged in, we all met downstairs next to the pool. We sat on top of the restaurant with some log fires in between us to keep the chill away. I had no idea what they meant by keeping the chill away. I was still in my polo shirt, laughing at them, all in their woollen hats, three coats, four pairs of trousers and gloves, whilst trying to sit on top of the fire. Just to keep warm. Wimps. Having eaten, the night passed quietly, and I woke to the sound of chanting, calling Muslims to prayer, and me to breakfast. I was feeling heaps better by this stage, so I tucked into a hearty breakfast of omelette, chunks of melon, coffee, curd with muesli and a couple of pastries. I was ready for riding again, and luckily Shumi had left during the night to catch a plane as he had to get back to work and couldn't do the full adventure. But what he didn't know was, he'd seen nothing yet as the best was yet to come. Leg over my Ducati and let the fun begin. Chapter 9 I fell instantly in love. Day 5 Alrighty then. Put the record on, sit back and start tapping your foot to back in black from ACDC. Or, you could change the words slightly and put, back on the bike. Yes, I have risen from the dead, eaten breakfast, showered and put my work suit on. My held rider suit, helmet, gloves and socks. Along with my former adventure boots. After three days of sitting in the support car, I was back to having 650 cc's of fun positioned nicely between my legs. So let's do it. Today we are heading to the mountains of Kumbalgar, where along the way we will see one of the riders nearly getting knocked off his bike in Jodhpur Centre, visit the most magical marble temple, and discover red-arsed monkeys on the side of the road. We started our journey heading into the middle of Jodhpur, where the traffic was on a collision course from the left, right, centre, straight in front of you, and no doubt behind you, to the point where Parakram was nearly taken out by a bike coming in from his right, that he just managed to swerve and avoid. The journey was taking us to Kumbhalgar, a destination up in the mountains, where we would once again see green life on trees, and be screamed at from the monkeys lining the road. The route wasn't going to be that long, only around 200 kilometres, but the roads were to make up for this. 
Well, when I say roads... We managed to get onto the highway which would take us more or less straight to our destination. But that would be boring, wouldn't it, boys and girls? We'd rather go on the road less travelled, making heads vibrate for hours on end, to the point where seeing straight ahead was to become a national sport. Yes, that would be so much more fun. Tally-ho, and off into the wilderness we went riding along roads where... Roads looked as if they were remnants of Roman soldiers' footprints, as they looked old and ruined, interspersed with talcum powder sand hiding death trap rocks underneath. This road went through so many villages, I began to think we were going round in circles. But in each village we went through, Indians were sitting there without a care in the world. I'll say at this point that I never saw one unhappy Indian. Not one. They were happy with their lot in their village going about whatever it is they go about. Each village, so I learnt in the car with tum-tum troubles, had sprung up because of a water supply, where the cattle, sheep or goats could get water, and of course so could the people. From this the villagers spread as the population got bigger, but oh my God they were ramshackled old buildings, some without doors, some without even four walls. But they know no different, and I'm sure if they were to see where we live in the Western world, they would become equally shocked and may even end up depressed because their house or car isn't as good as next door's. Seeing this time after time along our journey made me think, we just don't know what we have at our feet, do we? And that we have a roof over our head, clean water and food on the table. Just by having those you have luxury compared to these Indians and everyone smiled when they saw us riding through. Eventually we arrived at the bottom of the hills to discover the magical, famous Ranakpur Jan Temple, famous for its interlocking marble architecture and for making me go wow. We had to take off our shoes and socks, if we wanted to, before we could go in. We were blessed by having a priest take us around and share the story with us. During the guided tour, we had the tour because the guards wouldn't let me into the prayer area because I was a white man. So the priest, whose family are part of the temple, saw this and took pity. I felt totally blessed. I will swear on the Lord Almighty himself I was looking into a room through bars at one of their idol god statues and it winked at me. It bloody winked at me. Frightened me to death. I shared the story immediately and they all looked at me as if to say, typical white man, whilst rolling their eyes. Cheeky sods. Can I also point out at this stage that when I am saying white man, it's not a racist thing because they had christened me Your Majesty right from day one of the tour and we all had a damn good laugh about it, so much so I felt right at home with the brownies. A piece of history of this fabulous temple. The temple has four artistic entrances in the main chamber. There are four huge white marble images of Begavan and Inath, if I've pronounced that right. These four images, which are some 72 inches tall, have been installed facing the four different directions. In the sanctuaries on the second and third stories also are enshrined four identical Jan images. It is because of these four images installed together in this temple that it is popularly known as Chatmuk Jan Temple. The most outstanding feature of this temple is its infinite number of pillars. The temple can be called a treasure house of pillars or a city of pillars. In whichever direction one might turn one's eyes meet with pillars and pillars big, small, broad, narrow, ornate or plain. But the ingenious designer has arranged them in such a manner that none of them obstructs the view of the pilgrim wishing to have Darshan a glimpse of God. From any corner of the temple one can easily view the Lord's image. These innumerable pillars have given rise to the popular belief that there are about 1,000 
444 pillars in the temple. In the north of this temple there is the Rahan tree and the footprints on a slab of marble. The reminders of the life and preaching of Bachad van Rishtbaherev, the foremost amongst the places of Jan pilgrimage. Once the tour had finished, we made our way back to the bikes, put our boots and clothing back on, and heading towards our destination of Kumbulgar. Over the mountains, making sure we beeped around every bend to warn oncoming traffic, we eventually came across this lake in the middle of nowhere. Guess what? It's a photo opportunity. Ta-da! I digress, because I want to share with you what happened after we arrived at our hotel for the night. But first, once we reached the hotel and our rooms were allocated, we went to Cumblegar Fort to see a light show and to listen to a story of legend and bravery in Indian. It's a damn good job Digvijay was next to me as he translated the story that was booming out like a god of thunder reverberating through the valleys. The story later. We returned to our hotel amongst the trees where monkeys raced amongst the branches and off for dinner. Which most nights wasn't until 9pm earliest as Santosh kept snacking through the day so was never hungry. I was, so I didn't bother waiting. It was superb, absolutely superb. Here I was with my tummy okay and dishes of food lay before me. Rude not to, really. Then we heard singing next to the swimming pool and off to investigate. I arrived at the top of the steps and laid my eyes upon the most gorgeous girl I had ever laid my eyes on in my life. Oh. My. God. I fell in love. Instantly. Captivated, I watched their show. Even being made to get up and dance. Memorable end of the day doesn't even come close. Heaven really is an angel. Chapter 10 That goat looks very unhappy Day 6 After spending a splendid night at Kumbulgar, with me falling instantly in love with a stunning Indian beauty, we are heading to Devigar Hotel, which is around 90 kilometres away, and only 20 kilometres away from Udipa. But first... We went back up to the fort for another photo opportunity before shooting off into the wilderness along roads that made sure you were awake from the vibrations sending your eyeballs shooting off in every direction. Along the way we pulled into a small village where I chose to take a walk around with Digvijay so he could translate. It was something I'd wanted to do for days now to walk around one of the villages to get an understanding and a bit more about the culture. I was amazed that out of, say, two dozen shop-type outlets, nine of them were selling the same crisps. But not only selling the same crisps, having exactly the same display outside of their shop. Now, surely how did they all sell crisps when there just weren't many people around? Maybe it was for the tourists passing through. I just found it all very strange and then I came across a butcher's shop. Now... I knew it was a butcher's shop straight away because there were cages of chickens outside and a goat, not looking very happy at all, tied up outside trying his best at tug of war against the rope without much success. So I trolled in and there was a young man sitting on top of a table chopping away at a very recently dispatched goat cutting it into pieces of leg, rib and other bits there was no chiller cabinet, no wiping down the surface. 
complete with an open window and a door allowing flies in. But there were no flies. Not a one. So I asked how long it had been dead and what would happen now. The goat had just been halal, a means of killing by cutting the throat and allowing to drain for an hour, and would be sold very soon. But the way they cook the meat is for at least four hours to make sure any bugs are cremated so the meat is okay to eat. Having seen this, if I was to live in India full time, I think I'd be going vegetarian. On leaving the butchers, there was the goat still playing tug of war and I wondered how long it would be before he too would be being slip slap slopped about the top of the table inside. Back on the bike and to continue then. We quite quickly came upon a museum which was all about what I had learned from the fort the night before of a king, baby and a white horse. When we'd gone through the museum I did think there's only so many times you can hear the same story within the same building. The same story was showcased in a glass case, then a video display, then a display with life-sized figures. But it was the same story three times. So here is the story you can understand why it is such a famous legend from a battle fought in this area. It was here I became King Leah Singh of Rajasthan. Here is the story. Pratap's forces were decisively outnumbered, while mounted on Chitak, the white horse, Pratap made an attempt on the life of the commander of the Imperial Mongol army. When he saw that the battle's tide was turning against him, he charged towards Raj Man Singh, who was directing the battle seated on an elephant. Pratap made a frontal charge at the Imperial army, hacked his way through the massed ranks of enemy combatants and reached the front of Man Singh's elephant. Once there, Chitak reared high in the air and planted his hooves on the forehead of Man Singh's elephant. Pratap threw his lance at Man Singh, but the blow fell on the elephant driver instead, who was killed instantly. Maharana then took Chitak, who had been wounded by a cut in his lower right rear leg, out of the battlefield, running a distance of about three to five kilometres. They came upon a river 21 feet wide, which Chetak with his wounded leg jumped across. Some distance ahead, Chetak collapsed and became unconscious, eventually dying. Maharana Pratap erected a small monument for his horse at the place where Chetak fell. After the museum, we continued to our Devigar Hotel, where, on arrival, we were met at a set of gates to check we were allowed in. Again, we had just ridden through a village of dust. No road as such, very poor surroundings, to be greeted by splendour that surpassed anything I had ever seen in my life. This huge white building shining glorious on a hill in the near distance was exquisite. We were greeted by staff in immaculate uniforms. Then, upon walking through the archway into the main entrance steps, we had rose petals thrown upon us from on high, cascading down. I was absolutely amazed, because although I'd been made to feel like royalty at previous hotels, this took it to an absolute another level. Then, at reception... There was a young man with chill towels on a tray so we could wipe our hands and faces. A welcome most gratefully received. Then we were taken to our rooms. And yet again, oh my God. There was a marble bath, a marble sink, a marble shower, a marble bed base, a marble table, all on a marble floor. And I'm sure the only thing that wasn't marble was the display of biscuits, crisps and a personal toothbrush. It was off the scale. The hotel, until 2000, had been a ruined temple for many years, refurbished to a level way above anything I'd ever seen, or maybe will ever see with a stunning swimming pool, and views that simply took my breath away. Then, on the evening, sitting around fire pits on the legs with logs burning, 
overlooking the village in... Chapter 11 And on the seventh day... Day 7 Day 7 and our day of rest, where we will be going into Udipa, the Venice of the East, to discover and explore what this amazing city had to offer us, where getting lost in a palace wasn't on the agenda. So, off we trolled, with me in my black jogging bottoms, <laughs> jogging as if, polo shirt and my former adventure boots with my bottoms tucked inside. Let me tell you the number of comments I had about, wow, great looking boots. It really is tough being famous, you know. Anyway, we made our way into the city, deposited next to a museum of cars. If only we'd known that they meant was a couple of garages housing a couple of cars, then maybe we might not have gone inside. But we live and learn. Then it was off to the palace, where, not for the first time, brown people getting cheaper than white people. Plus you also have to pay if you're taking in a camera inside. Talk about milking it. Once through the gate we walked up to the palace and just before you get to the main entrance you're met with a view over a massive lake where in the far distance there is the monsoon palace. Once used in the James Bond film Octopussy. Always knew I was James Bond. Cue music. The Monsoon Palace is a hilltop palatial residence in the city of Udipa, overlooking the Fateh Sagar Lake. Once inside the palace, we took to looking around, quite fast really, coming across Gandhi's glasses that Ben Kingsley wore in the film Gandhi, along with copious amounts of armour, firearms, swords, daggers, and everything to do with the battle in a time long gone. It was a superb display. But maybe it would have been a great idea to get the services of a guide, as I found out very little. A little bit of history about Udipa City Palace. The City Palace was built concurrently with the establishment of the Udipa city of Mahara Udi Singh II, and his successor Maharanas over a period of the next 400 years. The Maharanas lived and administered their kingdom from this palace, thereby making it the palace complex an important historical landmark. The palace would take a guide three weeks to get us around. So once we'd had our fill of the palace, as grand as it was, we went into the scramble of Udipa Market Streets, where, because of the palace, the surrounding streets were filled with market stalls, eating places. Yeah, Santosh had a snack along with streets filled with tuk-tuks barging their way through everyone and everything plying their trade to make a living. We stopped to allow Santos to fill up. In fact, every time we stopped he would get a snack, and yet he was seven stone wet through. Must have worms. And I was still not allowed street food by order of BB. I spied a couple of things that would make great gifts located in the local shops and mentioned this. Digvijay pointed out to me that being the white man, I am not to go inside to buy, but to show him what I fancied, and he would go in and barter. Let the fun begin. I fancy those, I pointed out, and off he went, with me observing from a distance to see him shaking his head, pointing out that he was, in fact, Indian from Jaipur, and to stop trying to rip him off, enabling me to get the gifts I wanted for half the price they were asking. White man won, Indian shopkeeper nil. Win it. After this fun and games, we went off to walk down to the side of the lake to partake in some lunch. Although one of us was saying he wasn't hungry. I shall let you guess who. The road down to the lake was just nuts. And I mean nuts. Walking over a bridge, an elephant came into view, with a chap sitting on top poking a stick into the elephant's head, depending upon which way he wanted the elephant to go. Do you know something? The eyes of that poor elephant looked as if it had no reason to live. They just looked so sad. 
Eventually, finding a place to eat, we sat down and rested for around an hour, with me eating curd and roti with soda water. I must confess I was happy to do so because I wasn't risking ruining the remaining journey. And besides, I would be eating well again that very night at the Hotel from the Gods. The day ended with more bartering from Chief Negotiator Digvijay and jumping into a tuk-tuk to be taking on a ride where I felt as though... I... The real India is simply amazing. Day 8 I have often been in situations where I have enjoyed my surroundings so much I have been sad to leave. But I cannot recall wanting to stay somewhere so much as this Devigar Hotel. It was simple, pure, unadulterated luxury, with a young man who served us during our stay having a permanent smile on his face, making it an absolute pleasure to have experienced. But onwards we must go. On the bikes, after another photo opportunity, and onwards to Nimaj, which wasn't very far away at all really, only 240 kilometres. This isn't the whole story. It's not that far away unless, of course, you go off-road, riding through talcum powder gorges, having one of the team fall off and refusing to ride the bike any further. That gives you a clue. So let the story begin. As we left the hotel riding through the gates, giving you a feeling of being John Wayne riding out of the fort to go and fight the Red Indians, we headed for the National Highway. We hit the highway without much trouble and blasted our way, enjoying riding faster than we had for a few days, overtaking trucks, tractors, buses and cows on the right, left, underneath and if we could I'm sure we'd have ridden over the top of them too. Then, from out of nowhere, you get sleeping policemen. Ten in a row. Going across the road for no reason whatsoever, unless you see them, you get a quite an interesting surprise where your bum chews into the seat, your hands grip the handlebars and before you know it, you're being launched into the air to the sounds of Yeah, can hell! Eventually, we stop for lunch. Look at the rows of crisp packets. When it was decided, we would go off the highway and ride roads less explored, where only those who didn't know where we were going would venture as we headed off into leopard country. When you go on these next roads, beware of leopard, BB tells me. I hear myself shout, Feckin' leopard? What do you mean? Leopard! Oh, deep joy. The road, as you can imagine, started to take a different form from that experienced on the National Highway as the tarmac started to disappear, with talcum powder hiding life-ending rocks starting to take its place. It was during this little expedition that Parakram chose to forget about not touching his front brake in the sand. Coming off with a right clatter, not only breaking everything except pushing the rear view mirror slightly out of alignment. Slightly further along, having ridden through the sand, shooting along the road, I heard my head cam battery run out with a beep from my camera, so I knew I had to replace it. Thinking all I have to do is ride past Santosh, wave to slow everybody down and change the battery. If only everything was so simple. The moment came to overtake, so I twisted the throttle, got along Santosh. At the same time, he saw a fictitious animal coming from the bushes on his left. Pulled over to his right to avoid said ghost, our handlebars collided and I went shooting off right towards the bushes at warp factor three, thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm going to die in India. I saw a patch of rough ground amongst the bushes, did a bit of scrambling, managed to stay upright and arrived back on the road, thinking, oh my God, I must have knocked him off. But thankfully I hadn't, so we all came to a halt laughing about it. You know, the kind of laugh that says, I don't know how I did that, but glad I did, and I'm okay, kind of laugh. I changed the battery in my camera and off we went once more towards Nimaj, following the roads we eventually came into, the village of Nimaj. And I'm sure there is no point in trying to explain what the village looked like, but needless to say, there was this oasis of a hotel in the middle. We rode up the streets that really were not designed for riding up. And this hotel was again once a palace, 
Not as grand as the others we'd stayed at, but nevertheless, a palace. To us, it was more like a mansion house that people lived in. But it was real. It was Indian. And it felt special in more ways than one. When we arrived, our rooms were allocated and we were treated to masala tea on the veranda. But then, the owner suggested he would give us a bit of a guided tour to a local village where 900 people lived, with only one tap for drinking water, where their lives are very much herders of animals. I couldn't wait. So we all jumped into the car and off we went, taking the back roads to this village, over sand dunes, talcum powder tracks, and eventually arriving after dark, even though it had only taken us 20 to 30 minutes to get there. We disembarked, heading down a back street, through an archway, coming across this herd of goats. Well, the size of this billy goat was like a small elephant. No doubt, whatever it wanted to do, it was allowed to do. And then we came across the herdsman, who must have been in his seventies. He greeted me as the old man with a toothy grin. Slapping me so hard on my shoulder, he nearly broke bones. This may have been due to his life or the fact that he was on opium. And legally, on opium too, as it was his right to have this drug. The government controlled the amount. How cool is that? I was even offered some, but declined the offer. What they do is mix the opium paste with water, then drink it from a wooden vessel. Then came the next experience. On going into the yard of a house, I watched with pure Admiration, this old chap showing us how to make pots. In his backyard, with no electric, with only the lights of our phones, on top of a stone that he spun with a stick to get it twirling at speed. He produced three pots within five minutes that would put any potter I've ever seen to shame. He was absolutely amazing. Such a skilled man. And I recall thinking, that just makes a joke of the Western world with all our stupid health and safety. It actually made me cry, a little, to think in the middle of a desert in a backyard, four and a half thousand miles from my home, with no power, this man can do this. And he was as happy as could possibly be. Thought-provoking stuff, let me tell you. On getting back to the hotel, we went for a walk down this street to be shown... <clears throat> well to be shown the god of fertility. In Britain, this would have been defaced within minutes, but this had lasted for decades, being worshipped by the villagers. And if I had one that size, I think I'd be worshipped as well. Not only that, but after a wonderful feast of chicken and chips, yes, chicken and chips, yippee, followed a superb night's rest. The following morning, I saw a temple that legend has it was flying around in the sky, choosing to land here. Chapter 13 Today could be the day I die. Day 9 The final day Now, have you ever had that feeling you've seen things before? I had that very feeling with this temple because I, as soon as I saw it, I knew I'd seen it before. It was right outside the hotel gate, leaving me gobsmacked, totally and utterly gobsmacked. We had a very hearty breakfast where I even had cornflakes. Cornflakes! Omelette, along with lashings of coffee, for today was the start of the last day. I can't recall the last time I felt as sad as I was feeling right now. Blimey, even writing this part of the story has me emotional. So leg over my Ducati and off for the last day to experience riding my bike in traffic that was out to kill me. How I survived I will never know, but let's head our way towards the traffic from hell in Jaipur. Well, the day has finally arrived that after riding 2,000 kilometres around a desert, Four and a half thousand miles from home, with a group of people I've never met before, who were all brown, 
without a white man in sight except the one looking back at me from my morning mirror. I was feeling quite sad. Surprisingly sad. Especially after being ill for three days and finding the days somewhat laborious because we didn't stop along the routes to see very much. But here I was, riding out of Nimage, heading back towards Libawa Lodge, where I'd contracted tum-tum death, by the way, not wanting this to come to an end. I'd blended in with my newfound friends. They made me feel part of their family, had looked after me when I was ill, had laughed at me with through my weird sense of humour, but most of all, I'd fallen in love with the country. Its people. Where only eleven days before, I was worried about having a knife at my throat within hours of landing in New Delhi. However, before getting too soppy, allow me to explain what happened on this final day of this amazing adventure. We left Nimaj after seeing the biggest goat in the world, the strongest goat herder on the planet, and the most skilful pottery maker in the backyard of a house in the middle of the desert. We joined the National Highway back to Jaipur. Quite uneventful, really. Well, when I say uneventful, this is until we stopped at a factory producing marble. You see, my gripe had been along the route we hadn't stopped for me to discover the culture of this country, having passed brick manufacturing, feed cultivation, village after village. The only aspect I'd seen was at Nimaj, and I wanted more please. So we stopped at a marble production factory and I asked if I could go in and see how it was done. So I trolled across the area full of sheets of marble of all shapes and sizes wearing coats of many colours entering the factory door. You could hear the machine doing its work long before entering with sound shh, 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 shh sounds. There it was, this huge block of rock underneath a rack of twelve blades sawing backwards and forwards with water cascading like a waterfall to stop the blades from overheating. Health and safety would have had a field day. But that's what I absolutely loved about this country. Just get on with it. You know, like we used to in England when we were once the greatest nation in the world. The guys were standing around while this machine did its job and discovered it would take four to five hours for this block to be cut into sheets of around an inch depth to be finished off and used in hotels, houses, office floors, worktops of kitchens, along with so many other products. In fact, we had seen a lot utilised in our journey, such as baths, sinks, bed bases, tables, walls and pillars, holding ceilings up in hotels. This region of Rajasthan is the second largest producer of marble in the world. This one factory produced tonnes of the stuff every single month. It was absolutely fantastic. It was so basic, it was fantastic. Having thanked the owner, we continued our journey towards Jaipur, and after a while, you could tell we were getting close because the air quality started to change for the worse, and so did the traffic. When I say the traffic started to change for the worse, that is an understatement. If you recall on the morning of the first day on the National Highway, I was to discover the first morning's experience was just child's play compared to riding through Jaipur. Not only was this traffic out to kill me, but it was out to kill me to death and then kill me again. Only solution? Ride as if you're Mad Max and bring it on. I do confess, however, there was one point I thought to myself, this has to come to an end, for God's sake, please come to an end as it took us over an hour to get through, constant beep, beep, cars, trucks, buses, tuk-tuks, all fighting for that extra inch, that extra millimetre, and you had to do the same to survive. However, once you get through it and survive not being bumped or killed to death, I never once saw a vehicle of any kind bumped into another than this whole adventure. It was unbelievable. The sense of achievement and elation was unexpected. When we got to our destination, I shouted out, I want a bottle of whiskey and 20 cigarettes right now. I have not smoked since 1983 or touched alcohol since 2009. Such was the sense of relief. Mind you, I didn't touch the cigarettes or the alcohol. 
But just shortly before then, having passed through Jaipur, we turned off the main road onto the talcum powder sand track towards the gate of Laboa Lodge. And yes, there were tears in my eyes, which were also streaming down my cheeks. The dust was terrible, you see. Or was it that I had just completed the greatest adventure with the best bunch of guys that I'd only met a few days before, riding a magnificent motorbike around a simply amazing part of the world? And maybe, just maybe, they were tears of pure joy. I shall let you decide. Can I go back round again, please? We all eventually ended up back in Gagon, and I prepared to leave the following day. I really didn't want to leave as I'd found my heaven. I'd fallen in love with India. A certain Indian girl. Indian food, the real stuff. And discovered people from another world and culture who will be my friends forever. On the final night, Bibi came to my hotel to say bye and just to chat. He took me by surprise. After our chat, he said, You made this journey such fun. You had us laughing out loud, and you are now my brother. You will always be my brother. You are now one of my family. It really was the journey that changed my life forever. The end.